welcome you to the GLBT Historical Society Museum. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And excuse my back, everybody, on our esteemed panel today. Um, I'm delighted to have all of you here. It's um, such a great organization to work with. And with that, I just want to turn it over to Lamisa Mustafa, who I just met. And uh, there you are. Lamisa, uh, who many of you know, is the student coordinator of SMU Human Rights Program and uh, has played a big, big role in putting tonight's event together with all of you. And so with that, I just want to welcome our esteemed panel and turn it over to, uh, uh, to you to uh, introduce. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone for being here today and tuning in on Facebook and Instagram Live. So my name is Lamisa Mustafa. I'm a student coordinator for the Human Rights Program at Southern Methodist University, SME for short, in Dallas, Texas. So what brings us here? <laughs> um, well, this panel is actually part of our SMU Human Rights Program's week-long trip to California on our first ever Asian and Pacific Islander American pilgrimage. Um, so it's our first attempt to explore this history that a lot of us don't ever learn about. Um, and the history of queer and trans API a people is a part of that. Um, so we're here to learn from this amazing panel. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Michael, our moderator. Um, so Michael Wynn is the chair of the Gay Asian Pacific Alliance, an all-volunteer nonprofit org that works to reunite our family and allies through inclusion, advocacy, and love. Michael is also known as Miss Gappa 2016, Juicy Lou. Okay, awesome. Michael serves on the boards of Bay Area Lawyers for Individual Freedom, the oldest LGBTQ bar <coughs> association in the country, and Livable City, an advocacy nonprofit working to make San Francisco more livable through better transit and greener open spaces. So, welcome, Michael. Thank you, Thanks, Terry, uh, for the, a beautiful introduction to the space. Uh, hi, hi, everybody. I'm uh, Michael Wynn. Um, I use he, him pronouns, uh, and then sometimes I use she, her pronouns as my alter ego, Juicy Lou. And I would like to uh, ask the panel to introduce themselves and describe yourself, describe your social justice work. Um, how did you get to the Bay Area? What does it mean to be here doing that work? It's kind of a lot of questions, but I would like the panel to introduce themselves, and I would like to first bring it to Mia. Of course. <laughs> um, Talofolava. My government name is Yeranel Tawailati Vilvea, and if you can remember that, Michael here will give you $100. <laughs> um, but I go by Neo. My pronouns are he and him. Let's see, how did I start my activism? Well, um, so I too, I didn't hang out in this laundry map, but I, I was... Uh, Young enough to know at the age of 22, when we first marched in the uh, Gay Pride Parade, um, which is really strange because I think some of those videotapes that got found were part of this, and we were featured on an NBC um, documentary as one of the first gay Samoans to march in Pride. So that kind of gave me the itch at 22. Um, now at 62, it just seems like full circle. Um, Let's see, I have a son. Um, I was basically raised in San Francisco, so I've been through the whole AIDS epidemic and to see a whole community leave us, and also the struggle of people of color um, trying to fit into the Castro, because then in the 70s and 80s, we weren't really accepted in the Castro, but it's so delightful to see so many people of color here today. Um, that's my story for now, because, you know, I have a long history, we'd be here all night, so. <laughs> right. Cool. Hello, y'all. Um, how's it going tonight? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> um, my name is Sammy Ablaza wills I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the current executive director over at APINC, API Equality Northern California. Uh, I'm super, super thankful to be here today with all of the folks in this room, all of the people on this panel. Uh, many of whom are longtime friends, and I think that that's also uh, part of what makes this panel special. Uh, so I first got started with A Pink six years ago now, 
when I was uh, looking for a place to do organizing and activism work, uh, I had moved here from Las Vegas or I had run away from Las Vegas to come here and I asked people around me, I just want to do something right. I want to do something political, something agitated and something right. But I can't choose, should I do something for my Asian American identity or should I do something for my LGBTQ identity? And my friend kind of sat down with me and they were like, oh, Sammy, um, you don't have to choose, you can do both. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> no, one, you know, no one to that point in my life had ever told me that before. Um, and so I found APINC and that summer got involved as a summer intern and was welcomed into a community where I never had to choose one side of myself over another. I could just holistically be all of who I was. And when I didn't have to worry about that, I was open to learning things about myself and my community. I was open to trusting people, and I was open to asking for help in a way that I had previously denied myself because of fear and scarcity. Um, and that's the thing that keeps me in this work. That's the thing that keeps me here in the beautiful Bay Area, connecting with everyone, um, because there are still so many young leaders and young people and people of all ages that need to consistently be challenged to live through our values, um, and that we need to create better values for a world for all of us to thrive and feel seen and heard. And so a lot of my work on the day to day um, incorporates transforming the lives of people so they can live their best lives, be their full selves, and advocate for the resources they need. Um, and thank you again for having me. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Amy Suyoshi. Uh, I'm the Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University. Um, I'm a historian by training and uh, my specialty areas in history are API queer history. Um, I, came, I became an academic after working for several years as both a community organizer and tenant organizer. Uh, so my original background is, is in community organizing um, uh, rather than just being a, a pure nerd. Um, I, my, my introduction to social justice work is probably through my family. Uh, my mom is Japanese from Japan, my dad is Okinawan. Uh, and I was born here in San Francisco and growing up, my mom uh, would give me books about camp uh, as a child, children's books about camp uh, for the holidays and for my birthday. Um, so I did a lot of reading as a young child around uh, incarceration, injustice, uh, the, 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 the worry, the danger of, of government, authoritarian governments. Um, and she sort of really uh, trained me on the path uh, to, towards uh, community. She uh, always believed, she's still alive, if I, I talk like she's dead, she's actually still alive. Um, she taught me very much about the importance of community, of building community. Um, she was not a community organizer, she was an immigrant who would go to Cherry Blossom Festival and fold wontons uh, with the other uh, folks there. She was always very quiet, but what she really taught me was the importance of building community, even if you're quiet, even if it means just folding wontons at Cherry Blossom Festival. Um, so with that said, um, I, I know that many of us often feel alienated and alone, and it's really important for us to go and forge our own community, uh, even if it means uh, just folding one dance. Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Muhammad Sheikh Hussein Ali, short for just, just go by Ali. I don't think he has enough hundred dollar bills to give it away. <laughs> uh, so I might pronounce uh, he, him, and his. Uh, on one hand, I'm very uh, stereotypically South Asian. Uh, I work in the tech industry. I work uh, in uh, software industry work. And on the other side, I am uh, I, I'm a minority of a minority in a minority. I'm a South Asian Indian Muslim gay. So uh, it, when I first came to San Francisco, I actually didn't know much about uh, Castro. Uh, I didn't even set uh, foot over here. And uh, my uh, mentor is actually right here. He's hiding right now to make sure that I don't point out to him. Oh, there he is. Uh, I, I, I met, I went to Tricol, uh, the organization for which I'm the chairperson right now, uh, all, almost 10 years ago. Uh, and I went there. It so happened that at the end of the event, everybody was going away. I was like, why is everybody going away? Then I realized that whosoever stays late ends up working until four o'clock in the morning, cleaning up. And that's how I met up with the, uh, the organizers, the people who actually are the backbone of the whole uh, system, uh, people who put in their sweat, literally sweat and blood and everything into it, excuse me, into it uh, to do it. 
uh, my entry to it uh, was uh, from a very fun event, uh, but over the years, in the past 10 years, uh, the way that Twitter kept me on in this particular part is to provide a voice to people who otherwise may not have it, uh, to provide a representation to people who think that we don't exist, to provide a face on a name, to provide a face to uh, a whole section of the society that still exists, thrives, lives, breathes, and it still goes on and where uh, people just think that it's not possible to be all of the things at the same time. I am a practicing Muslim, I am a, a South Asian Indian, and I'm also gay. So all of these sections, all of these pieces can exist together in one single entity, and I'm here to make sure that people can see that and have a voice, representation, face, and of all the things. If I can help somebody somewhere to say that, okay, it gets better in the long run, it is not the end of the road, then that would be the uh, best way to uh, fulfill the path. So that's me, looking forward to chatting more. Uh, my name is Crystal Jang, and I am, um, I guess I've been called a long time activist, but I don't feel like I'm an activist per se, uh, because all the work that I've done has been to find a space for myself, <laughs> really, and for people like me. And uh, to begin with, I was born and raised in San Francisco, I'm in my seventh uh, decade of living, so um, I've seen a lot of changes. I've had the good fortune of being born in a city that was open to change and that fostered it and had allowed me to be who I am as an authentic uh, person. So um, I was born and raised in Chinatown, so we saw a lot of discrimination in Chinatown. We were actually sort of uh, bordered by 10 square blocks. And uh, to come out of that area was to take a four-way into foreign places for us. Um, I went to school, uh, public schools in San Francisco. And my activism, if it was, is called activism, started uh, when I was in junior high school. When I fell in love with another young woman and in, I'm gonna say it in years because I think it's really important, 1959, which is a long time ago, uh, where there was nobody else like us. But I did study, I went to the library and I looked up what homosexuality was. Um, at that time, we had card catalogs. I don't know if anybody remembers card, most of you guys don't know card catalogs <laughs> now. <laughs> well, you would flip through cards and you would say, okay, homosexuality. And, and so I would take a look at all the books, the two books that were available, and uh, one of them was the Kinsey Report, and read that it was okay on a continuum to be attracted to the same sex. From that, so I actually came out to my, to friends in, to the girl I was in love with in uh, middle school, and uh, declared my love in a letter, and she showed it to the whole school, they are all friends, and actually they were quite kind, but they, um, they would come up to me and ask about it, and uh, not, a, not in a really mean way, but I got the sense that it was wrong to, do, wrong to be that person. So from then on, I started to look at the world in a different way, to see if I could find anybody who was like myself. Of course, everybody was closeted, and in Chinatown, San Francisco, there was no one. In San Francisco, there was no one that was AP that I could identify API or like myself, queer. Um, so I just sort of started hanging around in places like 15 years old in the queer bars in um, Upper Grant area, the Black Cat, or places like that where I would sneak in uh, after I left my house in the middle of the night and would sneak in and at 15 I was hanging around with these white gay men in these queer bars. So it was really an interesting situation, but I was also lucky that it was a time, was time of change in San Francisco. It was a time where you could be a little different, but being different meant being still API, queer, in a predominantly white society, queer society, which we didn't belong at all. So my whole life was really about finding people like myself, trying to, gather our energies to create our own spaces. 
So being an activist was not about intentionally being an activist, but it was intentionally about finding safe spaces for ourselves. And we're still doing that now. And I think it's really important that we never give up and that we also, one of the things I want to talk about later on is about terminology and how we don't let terminology stand in our way. That we may speak a different language even to each other intergenerationally, but that we all need to speak heart to heart with our hearts and feel what we feel with our hearts. So that's where I'm starting from. This is an amazing panel. Uh, we have an uh, intergenerational panel, we have a very diverse panel. Um, and one of the main things that came up and up again in the, in the introductions you heard was sort of building community and, and a sense of community and a safe space and stuff. Um, for, and just to share a little bit, just real quick, I came from Texas to San Francisco, um, so I'm also from Dallas area, and uh, you know, see, like, I wish there was something like an organization like all the organizations you, we've talked about here, but there's nothing, and most places there's nothing. So we are very special to be here in the Bay Area, and I just, I just want to acknowledge everybody, and you are an activist, Chris Lodge, I just said right now. Uh, but my question again for the whole panel, because you know we're all about building community and a sense of community. So, what are the top issues that our community faces right now? Um, can be here in the Bay Area, can be here nationally, can be internationally. As uh, queer, trans, API folks, or or on behalf of queer and trans API folks, and I'll bring it to you. So, I mean, for the Pacific Islanders, specifically for the Samoan community, um, the whole LGBTQI <laughs> issues were not issues. Right? We weren't made aware of that until later on when we moved here. Um, sexuality was actually open and free and wasn't even looked at as being any different than being human. So some of the issues we have now is a lot of our youth are trying not to identify because of the fear and the stigma that is attached that society has put on, Pacific Islanders especially, of the LGBTQ community. Um, I just recently spent a month in Samoa, and it is just so open and free that I have to remind myself that it's not like that here. And why is that? Because it's culturally different. And I think when we lose those values of culture, it gets, it, it gets so, diluted that people are just like so confused. Many Pacific Islanders are always questioning why do we need so many letters? Well, it's because of, and it's a part of a process. So it, it's almost like going backwards for the PI community. And I'm only speaking for Samoans, and that's all I know. It's just that it's becoming to a point where they become angry with labels that they have to take, even our pronouns. Like when I'm at a Utopia meeting, which is an organization that I founded and helped co-found in 1982, when we ask them to talk about their pronouns, they refuse. They're like, I am just human, I don't, what is that? So I think we've kind of built a wall between each other because we always have to try to identify who we are. We can't be human. And I'm, I'm just saying for the Samoan perspective uh, from what I know. So Utopia now has four or five chapters that are currently involved with all the issues that we have to take accounting for being here in, in America. And don't get me wrong, I'm born and raised here in America, but culturally, my heart is with my people back in Samoa. Religion also plays a big part in dividing us as far as we are sexually. So there's still a lot of work to be done. I mean, it, it's so um, amazing that so many young people have now taken the reins and tried to really educate our community because a lot of times our community won't listen. You know, sometimes silence is more louder than words. So, we have to take a look culturally at where we came from and what sexuality was then. Because I know for the Samoan community, it wasn't an issue till now. So that's, that's some of the things we're working on. Uh, yeah, really hard. It's, it's hard to say, right? The top three issues for our community, because our community is so vast and so diverse. 
And I think that there's, you know, in doing this work on the day to day, when other people that are not not from our community hear about what we do, they're like, wow, LGBTQ API people, that's so specific. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it's not actually, it's not specific enough. Oh my God, there's so many people. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the difficulties of it actually that within LGBTQ API, there are so many different identities and cultures and people and ages and experiences represented within that. So it's really hard to pick a few different issues. So I'll just speak about the things that I know of this true from the, the membership base that I work with at APINC. Uh, I think one of the things that really comes up for our people is challenges around mental health. Um, I think even if we've make, made really big strides as a community when it comes to how queer and trans people are accepted and how API people find community, um, there's still a big, big lack of acceptance in our own families, in our homes, in our communities. And um, so many people don't have the safety of being themselves. And when they go to find that safety with other people, they're told they're still not good enough. Uh, and that has a big way of wearing down on, on our resilience and our, on our psyche. Uh, and I think there's just not enough resources that actually get people the help that they need when they're experiencing deep anxiety, depression, or other things that might be um, harming us on the day to day, making it hard to just get up and live. Um, and even when those systems are in place, they're institutionalized, the way that people are thinking about solving those problems is isolating that person and throwing them over there. But like the people from uh, the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective say, where are you gonna throw people away to? The earth is round. Um, and so I think that that's just something that I'm always thinking about, have been learning about personally, how we help, how we stand in community with people who are, are having struggles in a mental health crisis type of way. Um, I think another thing that we really struggle with as a community is supporting and stopping the violence against our trans and gender nonconforming community members. Um, I think as much as trans people have gained visibility in recent years, the violence against trans people has also become more visibilized and is really, really harmful when you walk onto a Facebook screen or when you look at the news and all the things you see about trans people are how dead they are, not how thriving they are. Um, and so for us at APINC and for me, especially as a young trans person, we're trying to build ways for trans people to feel secure, safe, and in community in our identities so we even have the chance of going out into the world and doing all of the other things that we might wanna do. And I think support from other LGB community members is really, really crucial in that fight um, if we are thinking about the whole LGBTQ community. And then the last thing I'll just say is I think that with the things going on in the world, specifically in the United States, with the daily attacks on different community members, um, I'm just feeling how deeply isolated we all are. Um, even if social media is popping off more than ever, people are connected deeply, maybe less than ever before is seemingly how it feels to me. Um, I know that there are so many days doing this work where I feel alone. And I just wanna admit that, and I wanna invite you to admit when you feel alone too. Because um, I think it's a really hard thing to go through life feeling like you're alone, but surrounded by people. And so um, I think at our organization, we're trying to foster ways for people to make genuine connections with each other. Because the power that happens when you can feel like you can be your fullest self and be authentic around another person, I think is life changing. Um, but it's really hard in a world that tells us that we must just work, we must just hustle, we must just thrive, despite all the other things going on. Hi everyone, uh, again my name is Amy, um, I am a higher education professional um, and so I actually want to talk about uh, a crisis that we're having in higher education. Um, many of you uh, may think that Asians all go to Stanford or Berkeley, uh, which is actually not the case. Um, I'm at San Francisco State University, 40% of our students are Asian or Pacific Islander um, and we have a national higher education crisis. Across the 23 campuses of the Cal State University, only 30% graduate at, in four years, and only 60% graduate in six years. If you think about a campus that is 40% Asian, imagine how many Asian Americans are actually not graduating from college. San Francisco State serves the working poor in California. We have 30% Pell Grant recipients, which are uh, low-income students. 
uh, as well as 38% first generation uh, college students. So I'm here on one hand to underscore uh, dispelling the myth of the model minority to say that the Asian American community actually has the highest disparity in income and education, uh, educational achievement. And it's up to us to uplift not only our own communities as queers and as APIs, but also to build coalitions across other communities that don't have access to education. Why is education so important? First off, as individuals, it's still the only vehicle for economic stability. Um, on a larger, more global stage, education remains the primary vehicle for social change, for ways to think about the world differently, for people to be more compassionate and treat each other uh, with more love and generosity. Um, so I'd like to just underscore here that education remains a crisis in the state of California. They say today, but even by the year 2025, we will not have enough college degrees to fill our California workforce. That means that there'll be laborers that will be imported. They're not really laborers, they'll be tech professionals. will be imported from other states as well as other countries. And in a state that's gonna be 70% of color in 2025, what does that mean? It means that the second, or actually not the second, they say California Public Policy Institute says third and fourth generation children of immigrants, right? Which is probably your kids or maybe even you are gonna be most at risk for economic instability, and in a state that is dominantly of color, it will be folks of color who will be feeling the brunt of uh, income inequality. Hello again. So let me talk a little bit more about the organization that I'm the chairperson of. Uh, through Cone, uh, it was started it's actually one year younger than the GLBT Museum. It started in 1986. Uh, it was started as uh, a place where it is safe, welcoming, as well as a fulfilling experience for the South Asian identity that was uh, upcoming, that was coming uh, into the whole Bay Area right from the very beginning. Uh, if we go back in the history, uh, the whole concept of homosexuality was not something that is looked down upon in the uh, right across the southern part of the Asian uh, continent. Uh, and how the, the colonizers actually brought in this concept and changed the whole uh, uh, the viewpoint from the people and how that actually had stuck into and got ingrained into the whole uh, culture uh, that the way that people treat each other now just because of the way that how, who they are loving and how they are loving and how that affects uh, each other's part. And that's how uh, Tricone was uh, created, and it still sustains for the past uh, three decades, excuse me, and provides the, uh, uh, a space where people can completely be themselves, uh, where they find a chosen family, where, they fa where their own immediate family is not providing them with uh, the love that they desire for, or uh, the support that they want. Uh, at the same time, it also provides them with a safe space, uh, especially uh, where not only are we discriminated against as being uh, homosexuals, as being queer, but we're also discriminated against our color. Uh, we don't have to go far away just opening the news channels, we know exactly what is happening. So from on one identity versus the other identity, and I can tell you one point from within the South Asians, we discriminate against each other. We discriminate against each other in terms of the country of origin that we are from, from within the country, the region that we are from, the language that we speak, uh, and literally the tone of the, uh, the, of the dialect that we speak across. So of all of these different layers of discrimination that are there, these are rooted, ingrained into the part. Not only do we fight with our immediate family, we end up fighting with our chosen family, and then, we come to a point where it's like, okay, we need a space where we can identify ourselves, be ourselves, as well as profess our love, uh, whichever direction that we uh, want to take it, and however uh, we want to do it. Uh, and uh, borrowing one of the points from Sami uh, on this, uh, it's not only about the sexual orientation identity that we talk about, it's also about the, the gender identity uh, that, that comes across and the whole, the whole spectrum discussion. 
uh, it's like every level has uh, each and every challenge that we have to go through. The religion, the faith, the region, the dialect, the, uh, the G, the L, the B, the T, the Q, and all the other uh, alphabets that come in. Uh, the one thing that, that we have to make sure that happens is the tolerance. The tolerance of it is okay to be different. It is okay to be unique. It is okay to be one of a kind. Because remember, if everybody is the same, then there's nothing to be, uh, nothing to have fun. The very name it says, the rainbow rise. It's if there are no colors, then there's no point of having uh, the whole colorful world. So increasing that tolerance amongst the people and having that amount of love to spread across is what is needed. And that is what we strive to make sure on, on a daily basis in whichever uh, phase and format that is possible. So. Okay. Actually, I don't know where to start. Um, in doing this work for so long, I mean, not work, trying to live authentically for so long. I'm finding, and I thank uh, Sammy for saying that sometimes when you're doing this work and you're part of a community, you feel you can feel very alone in this. And you think you're going on, you're thinking you're making change, you're thinking you're making a difference. And yet, when you stop and think and look out, you notice that everything's the same. That the things that I was doing and working on in 1959, 1960, of trying to be visible in my community, or creating a space, safe space for people, are the same things that are happening again. Particularly for API LGBTQI elders, I'm finding this to be the case. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been involved a lot in uh, two organizations, API QT, Asian Pacific Islander, Queer Women's Trans, uh, community and Red Envelope Giving Circle. It's, it's a giving circle that gives out grants. Um, uh, it's, and it's been incredible work. It's been exciting. It's been important. It's been from the heart. But late, I have to be honest with you. Lately, I've felt that the train is leaving and I, I can't catch up with it in terms of language, uh, in terms of uh, uh, being current with the issues that are, you know, that are facing us now, I'm having a hard time as I'm getting older, catching up and trying to figure out where I am and what I can do and what can be effective. But some of the things that I know as we age as API Queer elders, and I hate the term elder, I'm not quite sure how we're going to call it, but we're going to call ourselves. And by the way, I identify, I love the idea that and I know the feeling about trying to identify as a particular pronoun is very difficult. I had a hard time with it. I never really embraced it. And now we decide, I decided to call myself auntie. And we have an aunties and uncles group now that we are starting to identify with for API queer elders. Um, but aging is real big for us. Aging physically is a real big thing for us. I look out and I'm inspired by young people. I'm inspired by your energy, your creativity, and your thoughtfulness. But I'm also very tired. I'm, in t I'm tired because I'm being left behind. And not because we want to be recognized or we want to be acknowledged, but it's because many times we're not really a part of the conversation. We want to have intergenerational conversations, but what are we asking for? When there's an intergenerational activity or conversations, I see the same people getting invited. It's like four or five of us getting invited. The gray hair is in the room, so we represent something. Yet, um, it doesn't seem to go anywhere. We're just trying and trying and trying. So it's just the beginning. But some of the things we, we we're still, as a API queer elders still searching and trying to be visible in the community and trying to be relevant in the community. We don't want to be left behind. Um, we still need community support and we were able to give community support in terms of resource 
in terms of time, because most of us are retired now. So we have the time and resources. But also we are very much, many of our community are struggling with very basic needs. Housing, um, being food insecure, um, just being able to do the basic things in life. And I want to make sure people understand that this is a great time to be young. It's exciting. It's a time of change. It's a time of activism. But also, please, um, to remember that there are a lot of people who can't keep up. So don't leave them behind. Don't leave us behind. Um, embrace us. Let us be part of the conversation in a real way. Like I'm saying again, heart to heart. We don't need the common words, but we need the heart to each other. Um, just, just, I'm just so taken aback by how amazing this panel is. Um, I just wanted to share one, one more thing that I, that I didn't hear, but I, I know that it means it's, it's just implicitly said. Um, in addition to sort of creating our spaces, the th those, those things we do all the time, creating our spaces, being visible, um, what, whatever that means to us as for visibility, um, and making sure that we are lifting each other up out of um, poverty and like trying to, social change through education. Um, I think one more thing that we should do, that we should focus our power and energy on is like organizing and having more conversations about this, and really organizing our political power. Um, and here in the Bay Area, we have so many like Asian Pacific Islander people, populations. And I feel like the queer and trans API people have a special power because they are also LGBTQ people. There's a whole bunch of LGBTQ people. So we can have convers we enter a room, we, we automatically have double the power, double the say. I, that's how I say it. That's how I take it. I, I'm, just, I'm just letting you know. That's a, so one thing that I would like to see more of, and, and that the GAP is working on, and, uh, in, in conversations with uh, various organizations is trying to get more people elected to office because it's like when you see someone like an Evan Lowe and, and regardless of your politics, okay, um, or, you know, I, I get it. I don't want to go, go into that too deep, but, um, but regardless, like, it's not like an Evan Lowe. It's like if we had a million Evan Lowe's, wouldn't we, I'd be like, or not like Evan Lowe's, or someone else, Janice Lee, you know, whatever, you know. Uh, amazing people, yes, amazing, amazing, gorgeous people. If we had more of that, we, I feel like our community would be more powerful and we would feel more powerful and more secure in ourselves. So I just want to put, add that to our illustrious panel um, conversation. I, I do want to let everybody know in the audience, we'll have some, some time for audience questions. Um, and I am going to try to move things along as the moderator here, okay? Um, but I, 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 I want to want to do kind of maybe a rapid fire, like oh, a one sentence, like, a real quick, like, the first thing that pops into your mind, because a, a lot of the things we're doing here, okay, the thing is called justice for Asian American and Pacific Islander Americans and LGBTQ folks, but justice, what does justice mean, and like, and how do you define, to me, justice may be liberation, so maybe, like, you're free, and you're like, well, justice, what does it mean to you, how do you define the liberation, one sentence, please? <laughs> <laughs> She was my homegirl in the hood. <laughs> Justice. That's, that's how I'm <laughs> uh, Justice is when you feel like you can make a mistake and you can laugh and you can cry you can be yourself, and then you can fall asleep, and you can wake up, and you're not living in fear. Um, justice uh, for me means love of oneself, love of one's own community, and love of other communities. Justice for me is uh, Lady Liberty, the freedom to be oneself. Um, justice for me right now at this moment is to be able to sit in silence with somebody who may be very different from myself, but to be able to accept each other for who we are. Um, and, and we'll go the opposite order this week, just changing things up. 
Um, so there are multiple generations of activists in this panel, and um, how do we really how do we think about how we can collaborate with each other intergenerationally? What does that mean for the impact of our work? Like maybe you could describe it in so many words, in, in terms of language, terminology. Um, a lot of things that I hear right now from this panel is like, if you come from a place of love, you can make a big difference, and that's just like a plain, plain Jane simple answer. But I'm just curious, and we'll start, we'll start with Crystal here. So, so again, the question is, you know, you know, intergenerational collaboration and the impact. How can we do that more? How can we do more of that? Um, actually, we just attended a Dragon Fruit Network event this last weekend. And when I, I want to acknowledge my wife, Sydney, too, who is always in the back of the room. <laughs> but I thought it was a wonderful event because the conversation centered around being in the same room with each other, but not having to use our words. We actually made dumplings, or not dumplings, we made um, lumpia. lumpia together. And that was really wonderful. And while we were making the lumpia, uh, we were having a great time. We were learning how to make lumpia, and we were also getting to know each other. Um, and, uh, and we shared our, our thoughts and feelings and uh, complaints and uh, you know, love for whatever we loved. And I thought it was a great um, interaction. So I'd like to see more of that created around just experiencing things and not necessarily having intentional dialogue, but just, again, the feeling of being with each other and sharing that. I'm going to borrow a little bit from your points. Uh, for the intergenerational things, one of the main things that, uh, that I have seen for the community that I've been working with uh, is the sharing of the experience, the wisdom that has been gained and passing it along to understand. Uh, if we don't know our history, we end up repeating the history. And that is what has been happening around uh, throughout uh, the world. So to learn that, to make sure that we are aware of all the problems that we face through, what happened in 1969 that we are in 2019, we should not repeat it and still end up repeating it. So understanding that, uh, that information, passing down that knowledge, as well as inheriting that whole wisdom and putting it inside in your day-to-day -day, uh, lifestyle, uh, whether it could be in a group activity or it's just a storytelling exercise or just an empathetic situation, just sit down and have a face-to-face -face conversation. That is what would be the intergenerational uh, uh, the connection in the community that would uh, bring about. Um, so I'm actually, uh, I've been called uh, what's, what some folks call a uh, melder, which is a middle elder. Um, <laughs> I'm in my late 40s, very close to 50. I'm not quite 70, and I'm certainly not 30 anymore. Um, and for me, I think intergenerational, um, I'm in this unique position to both see folks who are younger than me and see folks who are older than me. Um, and I was raised, uh, socialized to be a good Asian girl, so I respect my elders. I give up my seat, I bring over food, I make jam, I make cake for folks. I make sure that you know, elders, if they need a hand, I, you know, I'm available. Um, and I think for young folks, I, I feel like I, if I can, I should give them a job, right? Uh, I think that especially as you hit your melder years, you become, you know, you might have more power and be able to hire people. And it's really about sharing your resources. That's what I think intergenerational relationships are about. So young people have resources. Uh, they know how to use tech way better than me. Um, today I was yelling at my computer. Um, and so my phone freezes all the time. Um, and so I, I do think that there's a way in which young folks can en enrich older people's lives, right? I also call on younger folks to carry heavy stuff for me. Um, as I get older, I'm not able to do that. Um, and then at the same time, I get advice for like, you know, how, how can I make sure that I have a secure retirement? I ask my folks who have retired those kinds of questions, right? Um, and then I try to offer the kinds of resources that I have available. So I can't fix a car, I'm not very handy, 
right? Uh, but I, I can cook, so I'm happy to share that resource. Uh, sometimes I can give away jobs, so I'm happy to do that. Um, as, as a faculty member, I, I can tell people how to write a resume, so I, I share that skill with people as well. Uh, so in that way, I think it's really important for us to have intergenerational conversations and relationships where we can share our skills, share our resources, not judge each other, and make our community stronger by supporting each other in the ways that we can. Uh, I just want to start by shouting out the Dragon Fruit Project. Uh, the Dragon Fruit Project, which is right on that wall right there, cool, um, was founded by Amy. Amazing. Um, and the, yeah, give it up for Amy. is an intergenerational oral history project that documents the experiences of LGBTQ, Asian and Pacific Islander activists, organizers, and community members. And when I first came into APINC, it was the first year that APINC had partnered with Amy to make the Dragon Fruit Project a truly community-run oral history project. And that first summer, I got to hear the stories of people, many of whom are in this room, like Crystal and like Vince, who is back there, um, and hear the stories of the, the work that they had done for our community members. And hearing that was life-changing, right? Crystal, who uh, say, shares the same birthday as me, I got to hear her story and how she fought for years for different things, how she advocated in her life and in her workplace. I got to hear the stories of community resilience, when people would show up for each other around the HIV and AIDS crisis when no one else and no other institution would and I was deeply transformed by that community resilience. And I'm still transformed by that community resilience and I think that's why intergenerational connections are so important because when we can see ourselves reflected in history, we have the opportunity to imagine a new future. Uh, and I think that's really important at a time in which our political imaginations are like minimized to the max. People can barely think about tomorrow, let alone five years from now. Mm -hmm. Um, like how can we really imagine a future that we want to create for ourselves? It really helps me to think about our history. Um, and so for me, building intergenerational connections are about nurturing the people and the places and the experiences that allow that history for, to happen and ensuring that the people who want to make a future happen are supported, that are in community, are thought of as together. Um, and I think a lot of that is difficult work, you know, a lot of it means that we have to take our own experiences and realize that that's not the experience of every single person. Um, we have to take our own understandings of the world and say, okay, maybe that's not the understanding of someone else. We have to take our egos and say, cool, I'm going to shut that down for a little bit. Um, but that's super important and necessary work to transform the way we relate to one another. Uh, and intergenerational connections, I think, are a big part of what makes social movements so powerful and thriving, and also fun. I will also just say fun. Like, there's nothing like having a party with, like, people who are from the age range of 20 and 70, just, like, all shopping it up together. Like, that's the type of stuff that I think keeps people around and laughing and joyful. So I'd like to ditto everything here that was said. <laughs> Um, it is very important, and um, you know, um, from my perspective in my gen uh, generation, there was a whole generation of gay men and women that were lost during the AIDS epidemic. We would come down here and it was like a graveyard. And the young people need to know what we went through during those times. There were no supportive services for us to grieve. We had friends dying every other day. So it's really important that we have these connections with the elders and the youth. I, I am now trying to claim that elder card, which I fought for for years. But you know, at 62, they look at you like, dude, what was up during the 70s? And I'm like, I had an opera. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> um, but it's, it's very important to have that dialogue. Making lumpia, sitting across from each other, or just talking about how it was, so the youth can appreciate these paths that were made. We didn't have what you have now, right? We made our own way. We made our way into the bars that didn't accept people of color. We stood there and had to be carded twice, sometimes three times. You know, I was the first Samoan doorman at Esta Noche 
only because I was Samoan and big and I love to drink. <laughs> but Esta Noches is not around anymore. A Little More is not around anymore. Amelia's, is, these, are, these are places where we gathered as young people because all we had were the bars, right? Right across the street we had the pendulum. That was the only bar of color that we came to and then they shut that down. So the dialogue is very important to learn the history from where we came, like you said, so we don't repeat those mistakes. So we can elevate each other, lift each other up. There's always talk about the API. Listen, we're all family. We all need to come together and to work these things out. We need to vote for people who are going to listen to us and elevate us. So everything that was said here, I double that. And just I want our youth to really realize, don't forget the past that were created. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple more questions, and then we'll bring, open it to the, the audience in about eight minutes. Is that cool? <laughs> um, so get those questions ready. Think about those questions. Um, and if you have specific questions to the audience, uh, the panelists, let, let me know, and we'll get that going. Um, but I just kind of want to think about uh, allyship for a second, and like, what role if any do allies have in our movement, and how how we do our work? Um, you know, different types of organizations are represented here. Um, but just kind of think about allyship and how what role do you see for them? And I'll I'll go back to our original. <laughs> That's a great a great question because Utopia was founded on the LGBTQ community. Um, San Francisco now. It's just all allies. We are having issues with having our gay brothers and sisters come and join, and I have all these allies. They're just so like, we want to stand up for your rights. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do this. But, you know, it, it says something to your work, right? It says something that what we were doing many years ago is finally working, that we now have allies who are just the biggest advocates, the biggest donators. I don't know if it's guilt, but it works. Um, we've even had a digital story that was done by seven Pacific Islander kids who are all allies and who talked about defending young gay people trying to come out. And to see these young, thuggy looking Pacific Islanders who are allies for our, for our babies, very emotional. So you're doing good work if you have a lot of allies on your team. Use them to the full extent. Yeah, I mean, I will, I will just say that there's a role for everybody. And I think it's about finding that role. And it's not always a like easy navigation to find that role. I think allies um, have to be willing to make mistakes and have to be willing to be told that you've made a mistake and like, it's okay, it's not the end of the world. Um, but I think there's a role for, for everybody who wants to be involved with movement work. And I mean that from an allyship perspective, I mean that from a disability justice perspective, I mean that from an age and experience perspective, that we need every single person who wants to make change happen. Uh, and so I think for allies in particular, people have to consider what are they willing to do that might negatively impact the privileges that they currently benefit from. Um, it doesn't really serve people all the time to like create a world in which every queer and trans person is like accepted and wholeheartedly loved by society. And I think people have to do, and allies in particular, have to do their own, ter own internal work to recognize what am I okay with doing? What am I okay with letting go of in my life? What am I okay with doing when I'm not in the spotlight or in the center of attention? Uh, and I think that that's really necessary and important work that allies can do on their own or together to make spaces for when people who are centered in that space to feel like their leadership, their voice, and their experiences are heard. Uh, but I wanna encourage people to always think about the multitude of ways that people can get involved because without everybody, you know, we're just kind of losing out on some good opportunities to create change. <laughs> Uh, so I, I think I have uh, a more, more, more of a message to allies rather than an answer to what we should do with allies. Um, I do think that uh, allies are important, but uh, my message to allies would be, um, and, and, and I say this to, I don't mean to say disrespectful 
sound disrespectful when I say this, but my message would be for allies to always remember to step back, um, keep your mouth shut, do your homework, and contribute in quiet ways. There's an old saying that I grew up with, uh, which said, uh, united we stand, divided we fall. Uh, and as a result, uh, allies are very much important. Uh, it's not just about uh, for us, but it is also about uh, themselves as well. It's a mutual development and a mutual helping out. As much as we gain from them, they are gaining it from us. As much as support that we get from them, they are getting it from us. It's not a one-way uh, street, it is a two-way street. It works uh, both sides sharing each other's abilities, the, the resources that they have, the resources that we have. We mutually share it, and the more resources come together in the pot, the better it is for everybody who can take it out from the pot. So that would be the uh, point for the uh, uh, allyship coming. I think the question of allyship and allies, building out is that it's very easy to build allies or be allies with people you agree with, people who are like-minded. It's the toughest work to build allyship with people who are totally opposite, who you may think are totally against everything you believe in. And yet, that's where the real work happens. We can sit together, each other, with each other, all of our friends and talk about the same things and agree on all these things that we agree on. And yet, when somebody comes into the room or in your space that does not agree with you, and you may think might be racist or homophobic or you know questionable in the way they think, because I question that, that is where the work begins. Now, how do we do that work? And how honest are we about doing that work? Are we judging them because of who they are and their experiences? Or do we try to move them in some way? And that's what I think the, the, the most, the hardest work I've done is, is working with people who are in those spaces, that I find myself in spaces with them, but that's also the most rewarding work to me. But it's really important that we don't just judge people, but that we work with people. And again, try to find that little bit of commonality so that we can move it the way we want to move it and to understand it. And empathy is a really big thing to uh, include in building allies. Um, I think it's really important that we take on that really difficult work and not just stay amongst ourselves. Because that's the easy thing. It's the easy thing to do. Um, I have one more question for the panel, and then I'll go right to question Q&A from the audience. And by the way, the question and answer from the audience will not record it. Um, so feel free to be as free as you want, as liberal, as liberal or not liberal. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna combine two questions though. I, I, have, I had some questions. So we're kind of in crazy times right now. It, it's a crazy time, right? Like there's a straight pride thing that tried to go in Modesto. There's white supremacy, like killing people, killing immigrants, killing children. It's, there's people being snatched, you know? Like, and, and how do you, and, and then and, and as leaders, community leaders, like how do we, how do we advocate for them, advocate for ourselves? How do we respond to these things? and and, and, and knowing that we, we have different types of identities represented here, so how do we advocate for those interests? Just generally, how do we respond? How do we do, what do we do? And how do you not like rage? I, I, I just wanna know, personally. <laughs> um, and we'll go, we'll go this way. Um, so, Michael, I wanna, I wanna thank you for that question. Um, I, th I think for me, when when I read your the that you wanted to bring up this question, um, well, the thing that I was reminded of is that we are in such a great space here, 
uh, with other Queer APIs, folks who support us, right? And it made me a little bit angry that why do we have to talk about white supremacy? We talk about white supremacy every day. We all have, we face racism, we face sexism, homophobia, transphobia almost every day, many of us, right? And so for me, it's like we need to protect this space, right? When we've gathered here today, we need to nurture ourselves, protect ourselves. And so for me, my response is, you know, think of third world feminists in the late 1970s, early 19, 1980s. Remember that it's about building coalitions, right, with other communities of color, other progressive groups, other queers, and building a space that then nurtures, fuels us, and allows us to continue to do our work. Um, for me, I, I have the privilege of being at a university in a college where I serve and advance the success of faculty and students of color who are underserved population in higher ed. I don't have to deal with white folks or white supremacy or rage against me in the ways that most of the people in, in this country do. And I'm grateful that I'm in this space. I'm so glad that I don't have to do the work that Crystal is, is considered very brave. But I also think that it's really important for us as organizers to nurture ourselves in our own communities, right? Uh, if you identify as API Dyke, to reach across the way and say hi to the gay Asian, right? And if you're a gay Asian, to like reach across the way and help some non-binary person, you know, uh, lift a heavy couch or get something from the top shelf, <laughs> right? Like, I think these, these kinds of acts of, again, love, as corny as it might sound, is what really sustains community. And so in the midst of all this craziness that is supposed to invoke fear and rage inside of us, I ask of you to remind yourself to take care of yourselves and think about ways of nurturing love and community amongst ourselves, because that's the thing that all those haters are afraid of. That was great. I almost am like, I'm done. That's great. Uh, um, yeah, that was, that was awesome. I, I agree with a lot of the things that Amy said, to be honest. I think that what we can do in the face of all of these terrible attacks is to nurture ways for us to not be afraid. I feel like I'm a broken record sometimes, but there's just so many things that, that want us to be afraid. And that fear will not save us. Things like anger, things like sadness, that can fuel us, but the love and fighting against fear are the things that are gonna sustain us for the long haul. And so when I think of not being afraid, I think of the ways that our communities can form community safety systems, right? How does everyone have something like a um, earthquake preparedness kit? How do we all know who our emergency contacts are? How do we have a deep awareness of who we're gonna go to when we feel like the worst thing ever has ever happened to us? How are we building the relationships in the communities where we can really deeply identify this is the person that's gonna support me. This is the community that's gonna support me. This is the group of people trained in supporting one another, whether that's through um, literally keeping each other safe at rallies or in public, whether it's just walking people home at night, right? How are we actually concretizing and making very intentional the ways that we're caring for each other every day and keeping each other physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually safe in the face of all these things that want us to believe otherwise? You know, self-care within a community is very important. I know this term, it takes a village, has always been used, but it was stolen from us because that's what we do. We take care of each other. And if we can't do that and allow all this outside garbage to come in, we're gonna be fearful people. You know, they always say Pacific Islanders are warriors, right? We get scared as well, but we turn to our elders, we turn to the youth, we turn to our community to really bring us back in, to not be fearful. Because that's what I think, all this fear that is created, that is happening today, really has nothing to do with us. Because we are in the forefront of providing space for people who wanna love, who wanna care, who wanna be inclusive of our life. So it takes a village, and everybody in this village is responsible for self-care and uplifting our community. 
let's try not to be on that social media thing where everything is being bombarded to where we have to sit there and think, damn, I don't even want to go to the mall. No. We live as a people of culture. We take care of each other. So that's what I think should happen, is be inclusive of our community and self-care.